Okay, good morning, everybody. And I'm glad you could join us for our ongoing class in the book of Revelation. We've been teaching through this for several weeks now. And uh, this is our first time to attempt to try an online version of this class. Um, I want to take a couple of moments and we'll review a little bit about what we've been talking about up to this point in time. Uh, for those of you who may be joining us for the first time. So uh, before we do that, though, let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace in our lives. And during this time of uncertainty and trial and difficulty, we pray that you'll grant our hearts rest and trust in you, that you are in control and that you have a plan. And that even though that plan might be something unpleasant for us, but yet you have a purpose in all the things that you do. We, grant, uh, we ask that you grant us your grace during this time and a confidence in your power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So again, welcome uh, to our online class. This morning we're live streaming this. Um, I do believe that this will also be available on the website after the streaming is over. Is that correct? Yes, I got a thumbs up on that as well. So... Um, now, again, we've been studying the book of Revelation. Let me just give you a brief overview of uh, what we've done so far. We've talked about who wrote the book of Revelation. Uh, he says in the beginning, his name is John. But there's been some discussion throughout church history. Is this the Apostle John, one of the 12 disciples? Or is it another uh, church leader by the name of John? The answer overwhelmingly through church tradition, and I believe the evidence is that it's the Apostle John, the author of the Gospel of John and the one, uh, one of the disciples on whom Jesus loved and leaned his breast on Jesus. So we believe it's written by the Apostle John. We believe it was written, uh, one of the last books of the New Testament be written, probably around 95 AD, uh, during a time of persecution. John says that he was on the Isle of Patmos, which is a Greek island off the coast of Asia Minor, and that he was there because of the testimony of the Word of God. Um, the structure of the book is pretty easy to see. Uh, chapter 1 begins the book with a vision of Jesus. Now, again, I could take you back through all these slides, but it would take us a little while longer to do it. So I just want to encapsulate what we've learned so far in the book. There's a vision of Jesus. He's standing amongst seven golden lampstands, holding seven stars in his hands. And what is explained is that this is the vision of Jesus who is standing amongst the seven churches to which the book of Revelation is written. So it starts off as a regular New Testament epistle written to churches. But it, the, the book is much more than that. It's also a book of prophecy. It's about what's going to happen in the future as well. So the first chapter is a vision of Jesus. The next two chapters, chapter 2 and 3, are messages from Jesus to these seven churches. All right? And so uh, the churches are Ephesus, um, <laughs> Anyway, of seven churches, I'm having a senior moment right now not to be able to rattle them all off by, by memory. And each one is appropriate to a situation that's going on in those churches. Each of those churches and the individuals in those churches are having some sort of problem, uh, whether it be external persecution, false teaching, or whatever. And most interpreters believe that these churches are typical of churches that we might find in any time and place within Christian history. So, uh, for example, you have the church of Laodicea, who is uh, rebuked by Christ because they are lukewarm. They're neither warm nor hot. So you might say this is a church that's filled with nominal Christians. People who are not hot in their faith for Christ or not against him, but rather lukewarm. And so Jesus has some pretty strong things to say to these people in this church to rebuke them 
about what they need to do to get right with him. And again, so these messages uh, sort of transcend uh, history and can be applicable to any churches. Certainly, we could look around and we could see many churches today that are lukewarm, that are filled with nominal Christians, people who are only giving lip service to Jesus and aren't really following him wholeheartedly. So again, the messages to the churches can be applied um, quite uh, well to modern day situations. And then after that's over, we get to chapter four of the book and we're, and John is caught up into heaven at the beginning of chapter four and he's brought to the heavenly throne in heaven. Are we okay back there? Yeah. Okay, I see all these hands going back and forth. I'm not here all alone, by the way. You know, there's a small congregation here. Very small. <laughs> and uh, he's caught up into heaven and he sees these tremendous visions before him. He sees the throne of God. He sees a vision of God. He sees four living creatures before him. He sees 24 elders seated around the throne. And they bow down before God and they cast their crowns before him. And it's a, it is an amazing scene. And we spent time talking about that during our last class. And then we come to chapter 5. And this is where we're going to pick it up partway through this chapter. We saw the last time we were together that what happens now is we're introduced to this seven-sealed scroll. Now, I like this artist's rendering here because if you'll notice, you see seven seals that you can see on the outside, but also allow, <coughs> as each scroll, each part of the scroll is unrolled, to be able to reveal the contents of the scroll and yet not be able to reveal the next seal. So this is kind of what seems to be happening here. There's this, this book, if you will, or scroll that has seven seals on it that is going to be broken and revealed as we go on. And that's what we're hoping to get to today, through chapter 6, where we begin to open these seals and see the judgments of God come down upon God's enemies. Okay, so here's this book of seven seals. And of course, uh, the chapter begins, like we talked about last time, with... with uh, uh, sort of a sad scene. And uh, if you look at chapter 5, verse 2, we we'll begin to, so open up your Bibles to Revelation 5, and we'll begin to take a look at this. And he saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and break its seals? All right? So again, remember, we have this scene where we're in heaven, we're standing before the throne of God, and the whole court of the heavenly throne room. And this seal is revealed. It's in the hand of God the Father. And no one, look at verse 3, no one in heaven or earth or under the earth is able to open the book or look into it. And John begins to weep in verse 4. Then I began to weep greatly because <clears throat> no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to him, verse 5, stop weeping. You know, it's kind of strong there, like, cut your crying. <laughs> Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. Now, we talked about this last time, but here we're introduced to Christ. He's called the lion from the tribe of Judah. We, last time we talked about where that comes from. He's called the root of David in that he's related to King David. And he's the one who is worthy to open the seven seals. And then we have a description of Jesus. Then I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne, and when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having uh, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, here we have this amazing scene where Jesus is the only one who is worthy to take the scroll. And he takes the scroll and all of heaven 
bows down before him. So who is worthy? The lamb is described as the lion of Judah, the slain lamb. And he has seven horns and seven eyes, speaking of his omniscience and his power and glory and right to rule. All of these things. And he takes the book. And then we have this amazing description of heavenly worship here. Now, throughout the book, there are times when John has great admiration for angels. And twice in the book, he tries to bow down before an angel. And you know what happens? He's told, stop. You worship God only. Okay, we don't worship angels. We don't worship kings. We don't worship human celebrities. We only worship God. So here, who are they worshiping? They're worshiping Jesus. And this is a powerful testimony of the Trinity here. Powerful, because you have God the Father holding the scrolls who is worshipped. And the hall of heaven bows down before him and sings his praises. And then here, we see the same thing to the Lamb of God who was slain. Okay. The Lamb of God is worshipped and they sing praises to him. Look at verse 9. And they sang a new song. See, they all fall down and they all sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals for you were slain, purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign upon the earth. See, Jesus is worshipped. Now, again, uh, there's a common misconception here. I think most of us kind of understand this in our mind, but when we think of worship, we think of singing songs. But technically speaking, the word worship in the Bible means to bow down before someone, to get on your face, if you will. Literally, the Greek word proskuneo means to kiss the feet. Okay? And so it's the idea of humbling oneself before a worthy person, a majestic king, if you will. And so the image here is the throne room of heaven where the God the Father is seated on his throne and all of heaven bows down before him and then sings his praises. And we have the same thing with Jesus. All of the heavenly court bows down before Jesus and sings his praises. And then verse 11 through 14, the whole rest of the chapter is a further refrain on this. Okay, from this multitude in the heaven. It says, I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands upon thousands. You know what that equates to? A lot. A big group here myriads upon myriads uh, perhaps billions I don't know that they had a Greek word for billion but myriad is sort of an untold amount and so you're timesing myriads by myriads and, and then adding thousands to that so it's this untold multitude in heaven saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. I believe John Walver, the president, ex-president of Dallas Theological Seminary, wrote a hymn. We know that hymn. Uh, I know it's really hard here because I'm going to have to sing all by myself. But if you know, it's like, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. I went too high <laughs> to receive glory and power and wisdom and strength. Anyway, but it's right out of this section here. It's a beautiful song, and it's simply putting the words of the scripture to music that sing honor and praise and glory and blessing to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Verse 13, And every created thing which is in heaven and earth and under the earth and on the sea and all the things in them I heard saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen, kept saying, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. So, really, chapter 4 and 5, in my opinion, are the most glorious worship passages in all of the Bible. You know, it's right up there with Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah sees the great vision of God, and, uh, you know, it changes his life. And uh, Ezekiel chapter 1, when Ezekiel gets the great vision of, of God seated on his throne. But here we have two full chapters of a description of God in his glory and alongside of him, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who was slain. And so, this sort of sets the stage, doesn't it? The Lamb is the only one who can take this book and begin to open the seals to progress along with what is going to be revealed in the future and so forth. So here we have, uh, we're going to spend m probably most of the rest of our time this morning talking about chapter 6. We might get into chapter 7, talking about uh, some additional things. But the, the seven seals of the book really go from chapter 1, or verse 1 of chapter 6, uh, and we don't see the seventh seal until chapter 8. All right, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the structure of these in a few moments, but um, let's just move on here and begin to take a look at these things. Okay. Um, we'll take a look. Uh, here you have a uh, good artistic rendering. There's no shortage of interesting artwork uh, related to the book of Revelation because there's so many images in the book. And so uh, all you got to do is get onto Google Images or something and type in, you know, Revelation artwork and you'll get pages and pages and pages of interesting stuff. So I didn't draw these. <laughs> and so here you have one artist's rendering of the four horsemen. Uh, we're going to start by looking at the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's seal one through four. And we'll take a, a look at some of these. We see the first seal in verses one and two. Let's read the text here. Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice of thunder, Come. Now it's interesting here that these first four seals, each one is introduced by one of the four living creatures. Now it doesn't specify which one of the living creatures it is, and you'd have to go back and read chapter 4 on the description of those living creatures. But I think the best understanding of those living creatures is to see them uh, as equivalents of the uh, cherubim and the seraphim from Isaiah and Ezekiel's um, visions. In other words, these special class of angelic beings who stand in the very presence of God continually. Okay, so the special class of living beings, if you will, that stand in God's presence. So in each case, um, the four living creatures saying with a loud voice as of thunder, come. Verse 2, John looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat upon it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So here you see this white horse. He has a crown, and he's going out with a bow. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is, who are these people referring to? And this is where you have to see the book, in, book of Revelation in close connection with the book of Daniel. Okay, now, we've talked about, those of you who have been in the class as we've been along, we, we spent some time talking about that relationship. Let me just review it briefly here. In the book of Daniel, in chapter 9, is a vision of the 70 weeks. And there is one week left that is yet to be fulfilled. Now, this week we understand as a week of years. So it's a seven-year period. And in his prophecy, he says that 
there's going to come a prince who comes out of the people who destroyed Jerusalem. And in the future, he's going to come and he's going to create a covenant with the people. And in the middle of the week, he's going to defy that covenant. And he's going to set up the abomination of desolation. Okay. So, who is this individual? And I think the best way to see it is to either see him as Antichrist himself, or I am leaning towards the idea of seeing each one of these horses not as an individual, but rather as a spirit that is unleashed, if you will. A spirit of conquest. Because then we'll see a spirit of, of war and pestilence and famine and so forth. So it appears from what we know from Daniel and what we see here is that this period, the opening of the first seal is going to bring in a spirit of conquest. Now it's interesting that the bow is shown there. The bow is a weapon, but there's no mention of arrows here. And this might indicate that this is a warless conquest. Okay. So in other words, there's some sort of uh, spirit of conquering of the nations and so forth. And again, this fits into this idea of a covenant being reached, a great peacemaker, if you will. Perhaps the Antichrist is going to come and he's going to come into power in rather miraculous ways. And he's going to create peace in Jerusalem and in the areas around there in a miraculous way without having to go to war. Okay, now we also need to see here, um, let's see, that there are different ways we can interpret these bowls, trumpets, and seal judgments. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about this, and I have a chart, hopefully you'll be able to read it uh, effectively. Uh, there's three ways to take this, the simultaneous view, the consecutive view, and the telescopic view. And I have a little graphic here that hopefully will help see what I'm talking about here. But before we get to that, I want to just set us in the timeline of the book of Revelation. We have past, present, and then future or prophetic. Chapter 1 was a vision that John saw. Right? Chapter 2 and 3 was his present, the condition of the churches. Uh, chapter 4 and 5 to beyond is all future all prophetic. And we see that the seals are here in chapter 7. There's an interlude after the sixth seal. You have then have the trumpets, and then you have another interlude. Okay, And then you have the seven bowl judgments. Okay, So the structure of Revelation is actually pretty easy to see. You know, you have everything kind of centered around this scroll that has seven seals on it. And each time the seal is opened up, a new judgment is poured upon humanity. And then you have the hardest thing in the book to understand is the interludes. Because the interludes provide additional information and additional visions. So when we get to those, we'll talk about each one as we come across them, try to understand them. Now, when we talk about the structure here, again, oops, sorry, we have... Um, seals, trumpets, and bowls with interludes happening in between the sixth and the seventh, okay, in each case. Well, then you have a parenthesis between the trumpets and the bowls. Now, the different ways that this is interpreted, there's some commonality between the seals, trumpets, and bowl judgments that have led some to think that these are all happening at the same times. They're just repeated for intensity. All right? So that's one way to take it. We call this the consecutive view or something along that line. Then, uh, not consecutive, but I mean the simultaneous view. The consecutive just sees this happening in chronological order. But I think this is good, but I think this is a little bit better to see this kind of telescopically. In other words, that you have the six seals here in chapter 6 are going to be opened up. The seventh seal 
actually contains the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments. So you'll notice that the seventh seal is opened up and immediately the trumpets start blowing. The seventh trumpet sounds and immediately the bowls start going. So the whole judgments are contained in the seven sealed book, but each seventh begins to open up a new series of judgments, okay? So um, that's the way we're going to, that's the view that I really take here. I think that makes the best sense to see this opening sequentially, but that the seventh seal contains the trumpets and the bowl judgments, okay? All right, so we're back to the second seal, um, verses 3 and 4 of chapter 6. Okay. All right, let me get to my notes here. Verse 3, when he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that the men should slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. Now, we have this seal here makes an effective point that the horsemen do not represent specific individuals, but rather are seen as God's messengers that release judgments. So the conquering is a part of that judgment. But then, whatever that peaceful period of conquering that takes place happens is going to devolve into a terrible war. Okay? And the consequences that come of it. So if we think about the chronology of this period, we have to take into account the parallels we see here with the Olivet Discourse in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke. And I've got a chart to, t to show this. Um, so if you would, let's turn to uh, Matthew chapter 24. Okay. Matthew 24, first book of the New Testament. Gospel of Matthew, we call this the Olivet Discourse. And um, Jesus' disciples come to him. Uh, verse 24, 1, and came to him to the temple, and he was going away with the disciples. They came out, and they pointed the temple buildings to him. It must have, you know, if you've ever seen a model of the Jerusalem temple, it was quite impressive. Even by today's standards, it would have been an incredibly beautiful building. And they were probably going, ooh, look at this, Jesus. And Jesus says, oh, well, you see all these things? Not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. So here Jesus says, there's going to come a time when this whole temple is going to be destroyed. And of course, we know that happened in 70 AD when the Romans came and they destroyed Jerusalem's temple. And it's destroyed until this day. It has not been rebuilt as yet. So his disciples came to him and they said, when will be the sign of your coming? When will these things happen? When will be the sign of your coming? Verse 3. And the end of the age. So it's sort of a, a three-pronged question. One of them is, when is the temple going to be destroyed? But also, the key question is, when are you coming? And when, what's going to happen at the end of the age? When is that going to happen? Okay. So this is where Jesus begins to talk about this. So we see here that in our development here, we see that the first seal is the white horse, okay? And here we have Jesus talking about false Christs and false messiahs. Verse 5, many will come in my name saying that I am the Christ and will mislead many. Then notice the next verse. 6 and 7, you'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See, you're not frightened, but those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. So the second horse that goes out is the red horse of war. Okay? For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places, there'll be famines and earthquakes. So again, the third horse is famine and pestilence. Right? 
So Jesus is mentioning all of these things, and he calls them the beginning of birth pangs. Okay, the beginning of birth pangs. So um, these are the events that are going to lead up to the final judgment, the end of the age, and the return of Jesus Christ. So there's a remarkable similarity here. He's going to talk about, we'll not take the time to read this, but verses 9 through 13, 9 is death. That's the pale horse. 9 through 13 is martyrdom. Jesus talks about people being martyred for him, and that's the fifth seal. And then in Luke, Luke adds, you know, kind of wondrous signs in the heavens to this Olivet Discourse in chapter 2111, and that's the content of the sixth seal. So there's a remarkable confluence here between these six seals and what Jesus calls the beginning of birth pangs. Okay? So if we go back to uh, Revelation 6, we'll continue on here in the second seal, this, this seal of war. Okay? Um, again, this is going to bring great war upon the face of the earth. So if we read this correctly, we realize the beginning of this period of tribulation is going to start off perhaps by peaceful conquest, a treaty being made. It might even be a time of somewhat prosperity. But at some point in time, war is going to break out. And it appears that it's going to be very terrible because we see the result of it in the third seal, which is famine. Verse 5, when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat upon it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Now, I'm sure that blessed you, right? A quart of wheat for a denarius. Oh, that's clear, right? It's funny when no one can laugh at your jokes. You don't really know if they're working or not. Even my wife's kind of looking there with a blank stare in her face, and I'm not sure if she thought it was funny or not, but she's going, yep. Yeah. You know what wives are for, right? Keep you on the ground. But uh, let me try to put something to this. Uh, we know that a denarius was a day's wage. So, um, I don't know, what's a laborer's day's wage these days? $15 an hour, right? Eight hours of labor, $15 an hour. It's $120, right? Roundabout. Again, wages vary so much in our culture, it's hard to say that. But let's just put that value on it. So 120 bucks is a day's wage in, in our world today. And a quart of wheat for a denarius is a measure of wheat for one person. It's in other words, this is the calories you would need for the day. So to feed one person, it would take every penny that you make for one day. The three measures of barley are a cheaper fuel, not as fulfilling, not as nutritious, but you might be able to feed one or two people for your entire wages of the day. In other words, this is bad, bad, bad scene. Imagine if you had to spend every bit of your money to try to get a meal for you and your family, right? That's famine. In other words, it's so scarce that it's going to be terrible here. And then there's an interesting statement here at the end. It says, do not damage the oil and the wine. This may be an indication that there will be inequity amongst the sufferers, that the poor will be suffering greater than the rich. The rich will still be able to have the luxuries of life, the wine and the oil and so forth, while the poor are barely able to buy enough to eat. Um, there's a lot of discussion amongst the commentaries on that, but I think that makes the best sense there. Uh, later on, we're going to see that no one is going to survive the ravages in the future. But it may be that the wealthy will not suffer that much from this particular famine. 
And then we have the fourth seal. Um, I'm trying to move this. Did I turn this off by accident? No, it's on. Got that. I'm trying, there we go. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the chronology of these seals and trumpets and bowls here a little bit. This is a nice graphic I ran across um, just to kind of take a look at what's happening here. Here in the seals, we have the four horsemen, and we're going we're gonna to see a difference between the fifth, sixth, and seventh seals, and there's going to be this interlude in between the sixth and the seventh seal. Okay? We're going to see the trumpets. We're going to see four trumpets sounded, and then the last three of those trumpets are going to be called the three woes. Okay. Now, something amusing that I found out, that when I had this translated into Spanish, the three woes are ay, ay, ay. <laughs> so I always wonder where that expression came from, but the word woe in Spanish is ay, ay. So uh, in any event, um, the three woes are going to be the last three trumpets and then the bowl judgment. So just kind of an interesting way to see the structure of the book as it's due. Now, Pastor Bill, if you listened to the sermon this morning, he talked a little bit about uh, some of the general uh, events that were going to happen as we were looking towards some of the prophecies in Isaiah about the future millennial kingdom. And there's four different views about how these events fit together and the relationship to the church. The one that we are teaching here in this class is what we call the pre-tribulational view of the rapture. In other words, that God's people, the church, will be taken out of the world before these judgments are poured out upon uh, unbelieving humanity, okay? But there are other views that are out there. Some see the rapture taking place during the middle of the tribulation, and that would probably be somewhere around, it's hard to debate and get these things timed, but most would see these seals taking place in the first part of the tribulation before we get into the great tribulation period. Um, there's also a view called the pre-wrath view that sees that that you know, the first part of the tribulation is relatively calm compared to the latter part and that the Christians will be taken out before God begins to pour his wrath. And then there are those who really believe that we, there is no special uh, rapture of the church, that the second coming of Jesus and the rapture are one and the same and so that we will go through this terrible time of tribulation and so forth. So just so you know that there are other views that are out there of course, we believe we're right, <laughs> right? You know, everybody believes they're right in their view. And uh, if we take this then, we take a look at this order of events, we see the past and the present being the church age and the church leaving the scene before this seven sealed book begins to open. And so you have at the beginning of this tribulation, a peace treaty that Daniel talks about during this one week, the seven year period. And we see the seven seals opening up in this first half. And then the second half is what is then called by Jesus and others, a period of great tribulation. Okay, so this, and, and this period is called three and a half years, 1260 days, and 42 months, or a time, times, and half a time, all right? So at the end of this period, Christ will return. Now, we could put in here under this tribulation treaty broken, we could put here the abomination of desolation. Because if you look back to, let me just go back a few slides here. If you look back at the end of the Olivet Discourse, after he's talked about all of these signs as birth pangs, what did he say? He's going to say, then when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, then you need to flee out of Jerusalem. Okay. 
So um, these events are all going to take place prior to that mid-tribulation point when the treaty is broken between the Antichrist and the nation of Israel and he will desecrate the temple and he will, uh, the children of Israel will see him for who he is as an imposter and a false messiah and great violence will break out against God's people at that point in time. So this is what, at least my best guess here of the chronology of these first seven seals. So after we finish the fourth seal, death, oh, I didn't really cover that, did I? Sorry. The fourth seal, verses seven and eight. The lamb broke the fourth seal and I heard the voice of one, uh, one of the fourth living creatures say, come. I looked and behold, an ashen horse and he who sat on it had the name death and Hades was following with him Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill the sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. Um, you know, we don't know how bad this current plague is and how bad it's going to be, but let me tell you something. It's nothing compared to what's talked about here. I think the population of the earth is getting close to 8 billion well, this, what this is saying is that 2 billion people are going to die as a result of this. That's unheard of. That's a catastrophe the likes of which this world has never seen after the days of Noah. Right? So um, I've thought about this in these coming days and I've thought, look how disruptive our culture has been because of this virus, the single virus. We don't have wars going on right now. Although, who's to say, you know, could this lead to war? Yeah. If the economies are, are ruined and so forth. But if nothing else, we should come to the realization of how fragile our world is, right? Uh, I, I'm probably just as guilty as the rest of us thinking, Ah, you know, this isn't going to be anything, you know, this is, you know we'll, we'll get through this, and I hope we do. But, you know, some of the, the worst-case projections have millions of people coming down with this thing. So, in any event, we see here that this is going to be a time of great suffering and trial. Let's see. I've got about five more minutes. So those of you that are waiting on getting that cup of coffee or that sandwich... Shut up, Siri. Sorry. Somehow Siri understood that I was saying, talking to her. <laughs> so let's talk about the fifth and the sixth seals, and that'll probably be as far, about as far as we get today. The fifth seal is really a change of scenery. We here have the martyrs revealed in verse 9 of chapter 6. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell upon the earth? Now, it's clear here that these are people who died for the truth, for their belief in Christ as their Messiah. Okay? Um, but how do we understand them? Are they martyrs of all Christians who've suffered for Jesus since the beginning of the church period? Well, I think the clue here, and the reason I would say no, is because that they are asking for the Lord, their complaint is, how long is it going to be, Lord? How long is it going to be before you avenge our blood. Notice what it says. On those who dwell on the earth. See? So I think that these martyrs have to be seen as martyrs who are coming up out of the period of the tribulation. Okay? Because they're asking for God to take action against those who killed them. 
and that those people are still alive on the face of the earth at that present time. And then uh, their reward and patience, verse 11, there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed. Okay. Now, the white robe generally speaks of, of cleansing righteousness. Okay, And so they've been brought into heaven. They've been comforted. They've received their righteous robes. And the Lord's saying, be patient. For a little while longer, there are others who are going to join your ranks, those who are going to die for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay. So that's the fifth seal. And again, that's quite different from the previous four. And the last seal in chapter 6 is this seal of terror. Okay? Cosmic disturbances. In verses 12 through 14, And I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. And the sky was split apart like a scroll when it's rolled up and every mountain and island removed out of its places. Wow. (laughs) So we have here very uh, fantastic images of cosmic disturbances going on. And this is similar to other places in the Bible. Um, and what this leads to, interestingly, is not repentance, but people trying to hide from God. Then the great kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand okay so there's an ominous note here at the end of the sixth seal that the day of god's great wrath has come and who can who can stand up to it well what we're going to see next week and our plan is to continue this um, as some of you know i was supposed to be in chile uh these next two weeks and then i have a had a trip planned to Peru in April, and both of those have been canceled already. So uh, our plan is to just continue to teach this class every Sunday. So next week, we'll take a look at this first interlude, and that will answer that question, who is able to stand? Okay? So thank you for joining us. Um, We'll close in a word of prayer, and I pray God's blessing upon you, and be safe. And uh, be careful with yourself, and we'll just pray that God will bring us all safely through this. Father, we thank you for your word. It seems so relevant in a time of distress like now that we know that you are in control and you have a plan. And Father, I pray that this uncertainty and this plague that's among us now would cause many to get right with you. Cause many to realize that how fragile their lives are and how much we depend upon you for everything. So we ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Bye-bye.